this, uh, this approach in Eugene, Oregon, and is the longest running alternative dispatch program uh, that we know of across the country. And as a part of that program, mental health professionals and medics are dispatched by the police department's central 911 system in response to non-criminal calls for service uh, instead of police officers. And on average, CAHOOTS responders require police assistance in just 2% of their calls. This ends up saving the city of Eugene an estimated $8.5 million annually in public safety costs, plus an additional 14 million in ambulance trips and emergency response costs. So, you know, that's real money. Uh, similar programs have been launched in Austin, in Chicago, in San Francisco, Albuquerque, Portland, Rochester, uh, various other cities like LA, Baltimore, Oakland, Dayton, and Charlotte are also exploring similar models. So the ACES bill uh, here in Massachusetts seeks to create a grant program to support alternatives for community emergency services, uh, increasing the availability of expertly trained law enforcement, unarmed community-based response options for calls to 911. The program uh, that the bill contemplates is required to make competitive grants to applicants to develop local systems of alternatives to law enforcement for emergency and non-emergency situations involving mental health and substance abuse. Uh, alternative dispatch programs offer an emerging solution that can save lives, save dollars, and provide critical services to those in need. Uh, and also worth mentioning here um, that federal funding already exists now for states establishing such programs um, via the American Rescue Plan. So thank you again to all of you guys for joining um, this briefing and again to Rep Sabadosa, who I'm gonna hand the mic to. Um, I'm gonna go off camera here. You guys can see, you know, I'm out in the field, um, but I'm gonna be staying online. I'm really curious to hear, you know, both the presentation from our speakers today and questions um, from the attendees. So thank you so much, Rep Sabadosa, over to you. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, it's really a pleasure. And you did such a beautiful job of introducing the legislation that I don't think I have to say too, too much. But I am going to do one hard thing and one easy thing. So the hard thing I'm going to do is try to make sure I recognize all of the legislators who are here on the call today. Um, and if I miss you, please just pop in the chat and let me know because it is not intentional. It's just very hard to scroll through. I want to uh, start off by uh, thanking Rep Capano and Rep Owens, who I see are here today, along with Senator more. Um, and then I want to recognize the offices of uh, Senator DiDomenico, Representative Eligardo, Representative Livingstone, Representative Tyler, Representative Mark, Representative Belsito, Representative Higgins, uh, Senator Rush, Representative Bovea, Representative Moschino, Representative Vargas, Representative Farley Bouvier, Representative Minicucci, Representative Driscoll, Representative Wynn, Representative Peak, and Senator Collins. And that was a long list. So I'm really grateful that you all are here to learn more about the legislation. So that was the hard thing that I'm going to do this morning. The easy thing is I wanted to take really just a minute to tell you why I got involved in this uh, legislation and why this means so much to me. And I apologize if it's a story you've already heard, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, and so, you know, before I was even elected, this was something that I was thinking about. And I, I started this work um, one day in the uh, parking lot of our local YMCA. And I was bringing my daughter, I think, to swimming lessons, possibly gymnastics, possibly one of the many activities kids do at our YMCAs. And there was a child in the parking lot who, um, who was having, you know, I think what a parent would define as a meltdown. Um, no more, no less, but definitely a meltdown. And the caregivers to that child were having a really difficult time controlling it. I don't know all of the background, what happened, why it happened, but I do know that at the end of the day, the decision was made to call the police. Um, and we were talking about a very small child, um, maybe six, seven, always hard to guess ages. Um, but it really struck me that for a child in the YMCA parking lot, the best solution we had as a community to a situation that the caregivers couldn't control was to call in armed police officers. 
that um, would have been a really hard decision for me to have made as a parent. It would have been challenging to think that I was calling armed officers to come in um, for my child's, um, for whatever that child's issue was that, that day. Um, and it felt like we needed to do better. There had to be better solutions. And that should be something that we were thinking about because, you know, police officers are, are what you, are the people that you call when something bad happens, right? They're not the people that you call when your kid is having a meltdown, or at least they shouldn't be. And from there, of course, the work spirals because <laughs> that's one small example. But as both Rebecca and Senator Cheng Diaz said, and as our speakers will say, the number of situations where an armed response is really not the right response is so numerous. So I'm grateful to all of you for coming today. Um, I'm going to, I saw that uh, Sen uh, Representative Miranda's office is also here. Uh, so I'm gonna flag that and I am, Going to turn it back over to Rebecca so she can introduce our fabulous panelists. Thank you, Rep. Sabadosa and Senator Chang Diaz. Uh, so I notice a bunch of people have come in, some of them with my name. We apologize for that glitch. Uh, we know you're not me. Uh, if you could rename yourself, that would be great. So we have a sense of who is here. If you don't know how to do that, what you do is you um, hover over the top right corner, the three dots. Um, and then rename yourself to, to your actual name. <laughs> um, so at this point, we're going to hear from our partners. And again, this is all about community-based uh, um, organizing and engaging with communities in fashioning solutions to problems. And this is a solution that can work. We know it works. And we're looking forward to hearing from, from some of the folks today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce all three panelists at first, and then they're, they know their order that they're gonna speak in. Today, we were gonna hear from a Springfield resident also and a member of the LGBTQ commission, but uh, unfortunately he is unable to join us. Ruth Zacharin, who is the executive director of the Mass Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence and one of our core partners in this is gonna be moderating the panel discussion and we'll also fill in, in terms of sharing a little bit more about why the Mass Coalition for gun, uh, to Prevent Gun Violence is in support of this initiative as well. Uh, then she'll lead a question and answer session with the panelists so people can feel free to drop your questions in the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, and then we'll we'll close it out. And our goal, again, will be for this, this uh, briefing to last for, for one hour. So now uh, the part that I think we all wanna be here for, which is our, our panelists. First, we have Barbara O'Keeney from Diverse People United. She is a licensed mental health professional and community activist. Uh, the Diverse People United is a Lynn-based organization with a mission of creating transformative healing through cooperative community-based actions. And it's such a pleasure to work with Barbara all the time in our coalition. So I'm so glad she's gonna be a panelist. Next, we'll hear from Daryl Murkison. Uh, Daryl is a Lynn-based community activist. He's a member of the Essex County Community Organization, or ECHO, and is representing the Lynn Racial Justice Coalition, who is working towards the creation of an unarmed crisis response team in Lynn. Then we're going to hear from Fanid Simon Ulysses. She is an independent, licensed independent clinical social worker. She's been in the social work field for over two decades and has experience working in managed care organizations, private practice, state agencies, and nonprofits. She has been our close, close partner in this and from her role with the Greater Boston Association of Black Social Workers. So she will be our third speaker. And then we'll turn it over to Ruth. So with that, uh, Barbara. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Hello, my name is Barbara Atim O'Kenny. I'm speaking to you as a member of Diverse People United, a woman of color and a licensed mental health professional of color. I identify with my immigrant community. As a first generation South Sudanese immigrant, I was raised by immigrant parents. Growing up, we didn't call the police or access mental health services. There's still an incredible amount of stigma around having mental health issues or needing help for mental health concerns. Due to the status as immigrants, there's additional concern about interactions with the police, which could lead to interactions with ICE. Within immigrant communities, there is just as much need for mental health services. Considering the level of stress and trauma experienced through the process of migration, which includes pre, during, and post-migration, Access to mental health resources and connection to community supports are imperative. 
I identify with my black community where due to history, we don't call the police either. Within the black community, there is a culture of fear and mistrust in the criminal system. This is derived from an understanding of the disparities in regard to treatment within the context of interactions with the police. Within the black community, there's stigma around mental health too, which contributes to a decreased likelihood of accessing services and increased prevalence of unaddressed mental health concerns. In addition to the personal impact, mental health crises have an impact on families. From my own family, we've experienced calling for crisis response to mental health concerns. We've called mental health crisis teams structured similarly to the best team and the local police for wellness checks. The intent has always been to ensure that our family member receives help. When we call the crisis team, their response is to call the police. Even when we ask them to send a mental health worker to our home. Even when we ask them to have a mental health worker call and speak to our family member, they call the police. I like to be clear about the fact that the police have become the first line of defense in response to mental health crises. As a family, we've gone to the social worker housed out of the police department. We were placed on a wait list due to the high amount of need for mental health response within the community. Before our turn, my family member went missing as he was experiencing a mental health crisis. The next time we, that we went to the police department, it was to file a missing persons report. Fortunately, he was found. The current system that we have in place is overworked. I consider what my family experienced a systemic failure. This bill would have an impact on so many communities. This includes immigrant communities, black and brown communities, and folks within the transgender community. With this bill would provide access to mental health services for folks from marginalized communities. The co-response model is not accessible for everyone. There are folks within communities who may not reach out for help, knowing that the police will arrive with a mental health clinician. This provides another alternative for addressing mental health concerns within communities in the Commonwealth. This bill will help to prevent the criminalization of mental health, substance use, and homelessness. By reducing the incidence of interactions with the police, this decreases the likelihood of hospitalization and incarceration. When I think of responses to mental health calls that have gone wrong, I think about my work as an organizer in the city of Lynn. Lynn has stories too. Lynn has Dennis Reynoso, a war veteran who was killed during a mental health call. For people that are experiencing mental health crises, they have trauma too. The way the police show up, the way they have to show up can be inherently triggering for individuals who have experienced trauma. The way they have to show up is with a badge and a gun. Social workers, mental health counselors, psychologists, expressive therapists go into the same communities equipped with art supplies, a pen and paper. This is a pivotal moment. Each of us understands the times that we're living in. Now is the time to ensure that mental health concerns receive the best response a response that will not further escalate mental health crises, lead to re-traumatization or violence. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for sharing those experiences with us. And um, as the uh, coming from the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, I also just wanna publicly thank you. You've come to our meetings as well to share those experiences and it's been an incredible partnership and I truly appreciate it. Um, next, we are going to turn it over to Daryl Merkinson to share some of his thoughts and experiences as well. Daryl? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Daryl Merkinson. I'd I like to thank all of our legislators and um, all other in interested parties for allowing me this opportunity to testify um, here today. I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. I'm a husband and a father, and I've been an active and concerned resident for, of Lynn for nearly 60 years. I grew up in Lynn. I went to school in Lynn. I'm a retired firefighter and inspector. I was a substitute teacher and a coach in Lynn Public Schools and a DCF caseworker. I was president of the North Shore branch of the NAACP. I currently serve as executive director of the Community Minority Cultural Center in Lynn. Simply put, 
I know Lynn. I know Lynn pretty well. I know its history. I know its politics, its everyday inner workings, its social climate, and its demographics. And I know without question that Lynn needs an unarmed crisis response team. And that's why I work as a member of the Essex County Community Organization and the Lynn Racial Justice Coalition to advocate for $500,000 to fund the creation of ALERT, the All Lynn Emergency Response Team. Our version of ALERT is a team in which behavioral health and crisis specialists will respond to emergency calls related to, the, related to mental health and addiction, homelessness, noise complaints, and other nonviolent conflicts instead of police. We believe that if alert shows up to these emergencies, instead of the police, it would reduce the unnecessary force used by police and would allow residents the opportunity to get the help and the services that they need. Many people support the idea of an unarmed crisis response team. These open-minded, forward-thinking people believe that over-policing is a problem. They believe that police use force on people of color more often than they use force on white people. They also believe that an unarmed, an unarmed crisis response team could benefit communities with these types of problems. But at the same time, these same people don't believe that communities with the, um, <clears throat> with the aforementioned problems exist here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm here today to tell them and to tell you that Lynn is one of those communities. And so are others in Essex County. For decades, unarmed black and brown people have been brutalized and killed by the Lynn police. In the 1960s and 1970s, Miguel Keyes, Bud Lewis, and Credo Wallace all died at the hands of or in the custody of the Lynn police. In the 1990s and the 2000s, Elijah Johnson, Randy McLean, and Michael Gaskins lost their lives during encounters with the police. In 2013, Dennis Reynoso, a veteran who likely suffered from PTSD was fatally shot by Lynn police after being called by his family to get him help through a mental health crisis. And just recently in 2020, Victor White was brutally beaten by the police inside of police headquarters after he was arrested for playing loud music at his own residence. Police mistreatment, brutality, and over-policing of black and brown people happens here in Massachusetts and, it hap and it's happening right now. Some people are in denial about this fact, but many people of color are not. We live with that reality every day. That's why we are afraid to call police for help, even when we need it. Unarmed crisis response teams would be a huge benefit to communities across the Commonwealth. They would enable people to get the help they need while being free from the trauma and unnecessary force that often comes at the hands of police. These teams would save lives and promote the peace and safety that we all need and we all deserve. Thank you very much. Daryl, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, but also grounding us in the personal stories of folks who've been impacted by these interactions with police. So thank you for sharing all of that with us. And next, we're gonna turn it over to my friend, Finid. Finid. I wanna first start by apologizing for not turning my camera on experiencing technical difficulties. Um, 
Ruth for um, the introduction and thank you Representative Sapdoza and Sonia Shandias for spearheading this bill and other legislators who are in, in attendance to hear us out. As a licensed independent clinical social worker who has been in the field for over two decades, as Rebecca stated, I can attest to the need for an alternative options to police response to mental health crisis in non-emergency situations, thus participating in crafting the language for the act, you know, for this bill, as well as testifying to support this bill and participating today is an essential task. A mental health crisis is not, is not a crime. It can be treated as misconduct, however, when law enforcement responds to nonviolent crises. From a clinical perspective, calling the police for non-criminal behaviors like mental health, substance use, and other behavioral health crises doesn't make clinical sense, and it goes against my social work training to involve enforcement in, in someone's health. What does make sense is calling social workers and trained behavioral health professionals because we don't perceive those individuals as law-breaking citizens, but instead are trained to see them as humans with visible and invisible wounds who are in need of stabilization, effective care, and treatment. Social workers and trained behavioral health professionals are best positioned to respond to call related to mental health, substance use, and behavioral crises. Not only are we trained to provide crisis evaluation and have the resource knowledge to connect people in distress to an array of community services, we prioritize human relationships. We lead with purpose, professional care, and cultural competence. Moving from mental health and behavioral crisis to mental wellness, start with social workers and, not other, and other mental health professionals, not law enforcement. The ACES Act would allow communities to create an alternative option to police response in nonviolent crisis. This is an option individuals who suffered from long-term stress-related symptoms, similar to what my colleagues just shared, due to negative encounter um, with police, wish they had when a family member needed help. The Greater Boston Association of Black Social Workers strongly support this bill. We want the community seeking an alternative to police respond for nonviolent crisis. No, we hear them, we see them, we value them, and we will fight for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fanid. And we very much feel your presence, even if we can't see you on camera right now. Uh, and again, I also just want to appreciate again, my. It, it is, it is, uh, we appreciate you being with us and it is all fine. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge uh, you bringing the perspective of social workers into the space as a fellow social worker. Um, I always appreciate hearing about that. Um, so as Rebecca mentioned, I'm playing a little bit of a dual role today and I don't want to take up too much time. We've heard from all of our amazing panelists and I just have a couple of other things that I wanted to add, and then we're going to get into the Q&A part of our conversation today. But as the executive director of the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, I just wanted to share for a few moments how we enter this conversation about the ACES bill. And as has been mentioned before, one in 10 police calls in the United States is related to a person with an untreated mental health issue. And the piece where we have really been digging deep into working on this is, it is estimated that between one quarter and one half of all victims of police shootings were dealing with an untreated mental health issue. Uh, and this risk of having an encounter with the police um, and being injured or shot or killed is that much higher for black and brown men. So the coalition supports this legislation for many reasons uh, including as a way of reducing the potential of police shootings. We know that reducing contact between law enforcement and the groups at greatest risk of experiencing police violence will save lives, reduce traumatic experiences with law enforcement, and ensure that people with mental health or substance abuse issues are given the resources that they need to thrive. And for myself as a social worker, I've had opportunity to work with so many people who experienced trauma, who were having emotional crisis, who needed a higher level of care than what I could provide to them in the moment. And having a uniformed and armed police officer be the one to respond to that emotional crisis 
can further exacerbate the crisis, feel very unsafe, and actually become a barrier to folks getting the treatment that they need. So we ent also enter this conversation as a coalition of member organizations concerned about mental health and wellness for all communities and wanting to make sure that every community gets the resources that they need to actually promote wellness and decrease barriers to obtaining a greater amount of care. And just before we enter the Q&A part of our program today, I also just want to appreciate um, Rap Sabadosa and Senator Chang Diaz uh, the coalition is made up of 120 member organizations, and we've had many representatives of those member organizations weigh in about this bill and provide feedback and thoughts uh, and suggestions. And I just want to appreciate uh, the rep representative and senator, as well as everyone in the coalition, for very much holding that feedback and making sure that it gets integrated into how we think about this bill. So I'm going to pause here. Uh, and again, just appreciate all of our panelists. We do have a couple of questions that have been submitted that we can start with, but we also wanna make sure that anyone who is on the screen with us this morning has an opportunity to submit your questions. So if folks wanna use the chat uh, to put in any questions they may have, I will start with the questions that have already been submitted. And then we, can, we will make sure that we try to get to all of the questions that are submitted in the chat as well. So, these questions are really for anyone that is on the panel. Uh, so anyone who wants to jump in, please do so. So one of the questions that was submitted was, what if the person who is in crisis suddenly turns violent and there are no police officers present to provide protection? Uh, and I also wanna be clear that as we are responding to these questions, uh, Rep. Sepidosa or Senator Chain Diaz, if you wanna jump in too, we will welcome everyone responding to the questions that have been submitted. So would anyone like to start with this one, which is about what happens if there is violence that happens in the context of one of these responses? And I think this question is really around how this would actually play out. So what would it look like if we have clinicians or advocates responding to a call and there's a concern uh, about the individual who's in crisis being violent. That, um, Barbara, this is Finney. Ruth, this is Finney. I can answer. Um, and that is a great question. And that is a question that comes up um, often. And I can speak about the Eugene program in, in Eugene, Oregon, the Kahoot program. Um, actually, in, in regards to all the calls that were made, um, just actually 30, um, 311 of them required police respond and only 24 of those calls for racked up required even immediate response with police um, lights and, and sirens. So over 30 years of Kuhu, there has never been anyone seriously injured um, during a response to emergency calls. Thank you, Fineed. Um, and it's helpful to know that there are other programs out there that have already been doing this work very successfully um, and that there's a track record for how we actually respond to these calls. Anybody else wanted to jump in before I move on to the next question? Okay, great. Another question um, that was submitted was, what if we just have police departments employ social workers? Wouldn't that be the best of both worlds? Having a police officer and a social worker respond. I can chime in, Ruth. This is Dominique Great. Price Conley. Um, we currently do have a system in place such as that. However, it, um, it takes away confidentiality of the patient and center in their care. The, um, their mental health diagnosis can get wrapped up in the police system and used against them ultimately as a barrier. Having the officers, I mean, having social workers and put the data into medical systems is more protected and HIPAA based. Thank you, Dominique. It's nice to see you and thank you for weighing in. Does anyone else who would like to respond to? Yeah, yeah and Please. I could also add to that, um, Ruth, if you don't mind, it's, it's really isn't an either or situation. It's both and. Many police departments choose to employ um, social workers who cold response to situation that need escalation. 
the ACES Act doesn't discount that model, um, which worked for some communities. Instead, the ACES Act would empower communities to create an additional option for unarmed crisis response to deal with crises um, that don't require law enforcement. So um, it's possible for a community to have both social workers embedded within their police department into an established alternative form. Um, but what the ACES Act is um, doing is just giving the community, empowering the community to create an additional option to that. And if I could just add as well, um, there are folks within specific communities may not feel as comfortable as well, even with the co-response model, and even knowing that a mental health worker will be accompanying the police, just with knowing that the police will have their presence there, kind of having that alternative where it's just the mental health workers may be a better option um, for folks who would feel more comfortable with that sort of response. Thank you, everyone. And just the other piece that I wanted to um, highlight as well, I know from our conversations around the bill, that we do really want to empower communities to figure out what makes sense for their communities, as well as get input from folks in community when they're crafting those responses. And that feels like an important piece to highlight. So it's not a one size fits all approach. It really allows for a lot of community input into what the model needs to look like. Thank you Before for next bringing that up. And I do want to um, add that this is a, a great, you know, bill that is going to be driven by the community um, because we see the community as the experts. Thank you, Finit. Moving on to our next question, which I think may be targeted more towards the social workers in the space. What are specific interventions that social workers would use during these calls? I, I can start, um, again, everyone's um, functioning may be different. It's not a one size fits all. It's more about the um, evaluation. So depending on the needs, the social worker make the determination depending on, on the crisis. But you know, all social workers are trained um, to provide um, evaluation based on um, the crisis. I also like to add that, you know, we'll center the client um, as a strength of their advocacy as well as collaborative. Um, a collaborative members um, that called will use a culturally competent um, skill set in terms of addressing the situation, being aware of person environment. Um, and ultimately, we will um, seek to find interventions after um, and supports that can help the client be successful rather than penal options. And interventions will be based on the outcome of the assessment. To say by looking at the person, a social worker will be able to determine um, the intervention is inaccurate. It's all gonna be based on the evaluation conducted at the time. And don't forget social worker have all the tools um, in the toolbox to, to um, plan accordingly. That's the training. Thank you. And I also wanted to invite Daryl and Barbara to jump in if you have any thoughts about what kind of interventions you would like to see implemented in your community that you think would really help folks who are experiencing crisis. Carol, Barbara, do one of you want to weigh in? Um, yeah, sure. Were you saying something, Daryl? No, I wasn't quite sure if she wanted us to weigh in right now. I was just kind of waiting. Right. If I can um, go ahead. I think um, a really big kind of um, similar to what was highlighted, I think the cultural piece is really important. I think it make, makes a significant difference You know, if the providers who are um, addressing the call um, are diverse as well and have their own cultural backgrounds and identities that they're um, kind of pulling from and their own understanding of how that could impact um, the, um, the mental health concerns that folks are experiencing, kind of how they feel about the mental health system and um, how, how quickly they're able to kind of um, like trust in the provider and be able to, to kind of work with them to ensure that their, um, you know, their mental health crisis is being addressed. So I think kind of have, making sure that the, the teams who are addressing it are diverse is really important, even if they were like community members or folks who were kind of part of the community, I kind of understood the, the needs of the community would be important. Thank you, Barbara. Gerald, do you want to jump in? 
Um, yeah, I, I think that um, I was actually having a conversation on something similar to this with a friend of mine who happens to be in law enforcement the other day. And um, he was saying that he, he believes that police officers still should be um, the first ones called. And if they have to have some sort of a, a, a formula that they come in as a, a, a backup or something like that, they were saying that they should be called at the same time and they should be standing by just in case something happened. And what I try to impress upon him is that that could be a possible model that's used, but at the same time, it's, we will call you when we need you. And I think we have trained professionals that are able to do the job to try to de-escalate these situations as best they probably could. And when, when people see police arrive on a scene, it, it gives you a, a, a sense of heightened awareness. To say, if, if you're the, for lack of better words, to say the, the, the victim that's there, the person that needs this help, with anyone, your blood pressure is gonna rise when you see police there. Because nine times out of 10, when police come to any, any scene, nothing good is happening. So you're not even sure. Police are so controlling that they have a tendency to escalate a situation just by their presence. So I would just like to say, say that we are in a trial basis for something like this. But I think that we have trained professionals that, that can respond to these things. And if they feel as though the situation is escalating to a point where they need police help, they will call them. Just like in any case, where anybody needs police, they call them. So you respond when we call you. And, and if we find uh, over time that this is not, this not best for us, it's not best for uh, the citizens of, of Lynn or any other community, then we, we can uh, adapt to something different. But I, I still think that um, the way that we're going about things right now, that we want some trained professionals going in there that are, are, are not armed, not threatening to people, that this would be the best approach for right now. Thank you, Daryl. I appreciate you bringing that perspective in. And just one other um, piece that I wanted to highlight that was brought up by a member of our coalition's leadership team is the importance of having folks from the community not just craft the response, but be involved in providing it and how these programs can also be a path to employment from folks from the communities being served. So that it's people who are um, not only very aware of the issues that their community faces, but have personal relationships or trusted folks in the community and also have an opportunity to, towards this path to employment too. Uh, and that's just something I wanted to lift up. I am now gonna turn to switch to a question that's being asked by someone who was with us this morning. Um, and I wanna apologize if I mispronounced your name, Fatima. Would you like to come on and ask your questions and please correct me if I mispronounce your name? Yeah, no problem. This is Fatima. Um, she, her, hers pronouns. I'm with Muslim Justice League. We're based in Boston um, and have been doing a lot of work around this actually, um, uh, particularly with the city of Boston. So I'm, I'm curious, I'm still just learning about this about this bill and uh, you know, just saw that this briefing was happening this morning and glad that I hopped on. Um, and I'm glad that folks are talking about, you know, the wide spectrum of different kinds of alternative response programs. So, you know, we've seen people call the co-response where, you know, police are going out with clinicians an alternative. We've seen people call uh, co-response between like EMTs and clinicians an alternative versus like actually doing you know, community-based programs that are training, uh, you know, new people specifically for this kind of role. Um, and I'm really curious, you know, because from what we've seen uh, and from what we know from our community folks and listening sessions and talking about this a lot, you know, social workers and EMTs play a role in policing people as well, right? And often um, have been part of the problem or don't necessarily represent, as some of you have, have mentioned, don't represent the communities that, that need this the most. We, we heard from many people who asked about, you know, 
language access, right? Like actually just making sure people who are showing up are from your neighborhood, speak your language, like actually feel like part of your um, community. So even, you know, a, a response that is, uh, you know, rooted in current roles that don't reflect that could be could be an issue. So we in Boston have been really pushing for, you know, funding actually, you know, community-based, community-designed responses. Um, and I'm curious, like, how, how will this bill actually work? You know, like, are the grants really open to any kind of response? If someone says, we have an alternative response that actually includes the police, is that, you know, viable <laughs> for these grants? Or, you know, is it going to be weighted towards, you know, real community alternatives that are, that are new and that take a lot more, you know, work and imagination and effort that really should be um, supported and funded. Yeah, I'm happy to respond to that because I think, I really think that's a fantastic question and it comes up periodically. Um, there is a program that DPH has rolled out now um, that on its face appears to require a collaboration with the police or that the police be part of these teams. This act specifically says that's not what um, we're looking for, is that these would be community-based organization or organizations in partnership with the municipality coming together to determine a program, perhaps it would look like the Eugene model or there's a model in um, Colorado, the STAR model, um, or, or, or one other type of model that is disconnected um, from the police. And we think that's a really important component of the program. Also, it's really important to point out that this is a voluntary program. So it's the, the state would be saying, we believe that communities can decide how to do this and you can apply community-based organization with the municipality and then the grant would be issued under EOHHS but there would be a group of community-based organizations and others who would sit on the panel basically on the commission looking at the grants and determining who would get funding and that's also the body that would be reported to for results. Um, of how the programs are working. So it would be in statute into the future. This is a program we have here in Massachusetts that is funded by the state and there's federal dollars to do that as well that would allow municipalities with community-based organizations to do emergency response differently, decoupled from the police. And thank you for that question, Fatima. I think it really highlights the importance of not just community input, but accountability to the community at all steps of decision making and implementation, too. So I thank you for bringing that question up. Is there anyone else who wanted to respond to that before we move on to another question? Okay, great. To add there was a no, I need, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add that there is an oversight board that will be um, overseeing um, grantees to ensure what Fatima's concerns are are being met, like ensuring that the uh, response team reflect the communities um, that they're working in. Thank you for me, need. Um, two part question, both in the chat, um, and I also received this question in another way, which is about how this would be funded. Um, how are other programs funding these services? What would that look like in Massachusetts? And I'm wondering, Rep Sabadosa, if you would like to take that. I, I'm grateful that you just read the question because I was starting a very long response in the chat. So thank you uh, for that. Um, so we definitely envision this legislation as taking advantage of the federal funding that is coming in. Um, the state of Massachusetts is participating in the uh, in the uh, 
1115 waiver, part of our request rather, is to um, bring in those federal dollars that came through with the CARES Act to fund programs just like this. The federal government will pay 80% of those costs over three years. There's also an initial setup um, funds that the state can access. And because Massachusetts is already looking to get that money, this bill really sets up how then we would take the money and distribute it to the community. So um, I don't want to minimize the bill in any way, but it's a little bit of a pass through for that money. We're not actually asking this to come out of the state budget, although uh, I don't know that I would be opposed to that in the future. Um, anytime there is you know, that extra money, I think this is a really valuable way to get it into our communities. Um, and I hope I answered that in full. I don't know, Rebecca, if you wanted to add anything to that. No, that, that's exactly what I would have said as well. Great, thank you for that. And I just also just want to lift up in the chat. Um, there was a comment about the heart program in Cambridge. Um, and I know we already talked about the community being very involved in both the implementation and oversight. But I think this also really gets at the importance of recognizing what community based responses are already in place. Uh, so that when there are already uh, these programs existing in different communities, how would those get integrated? Um, and how do those programs get involved in being able to say what happens with these funds? So I don't know if it's someone wants to touch on that really briefly. I think I will just say that um, I wanted to highlight that because I feel like with all of the pieces we've already talked about, the importance of getting community members involved in oversight, I think it's also gonna be really important that we look at the solutions that are already happening and making sure that things are not put in place that work against that or are not including those perspectives and that expertise that already exists in the implementation of this programming. So I appreciate that folks are bringing that up. And I'm also seeing in the chat, just some other comments, somebody dropped an article uh, about some of the pro-response models, just would encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, as well as just the importance of continuing to incorporate community voices and community expertise as this moves forward. Uh, there's one other question at the bottom. Uh, how does this relate to the federal 988 effort? And I'm wondering, I'm looking at you, Rep. Sabato, so I don't know if you want to touch on that one as well. I'll take a stab at it. And then if there are wiser folks who want to jump in, I'm happy to have them add their expertise. Um, I will say that I, I don't see this as a sort of replacement, but rather an integration um, with that model. I think that um, it's going to take time for people to uh, to not always go to 911 um, when there is an emergency. And we have to be we have to recognize that. I know that it's, it's ingrained in me and I'm sure it's ingrained in generations before me. Um, so we've talked a lot with this legislation about the importance of training dispatch, of making sure that we're able to direct calls as best they go. I see the addition of the um, 988 model to be a great and positive thing, but I think that um, we're going to have to work on both the 911 side and the 988 side for, for quite a while um, before we're actually seeing the type of response that we'd really like to in our communities. Well, the one other thing I would add to that is just that um, as 988 rolls out, and it will be rolling out in July, it's a federal phone number now for mental health crises in case people don't, don't know what it is. Um, it would be really great to have ACEs already in place because then there could be a plan for the state to say that, okay, as mental health crises come into 988, communities have the ability to set up these programs that would divert divert calls to the community-based model, the, the ACEs model. Um, I have a little bit of a worry that 988 calls could also end up going to, you know, to police when they're mental health crises calls. Now they're scheduled to go first to the Samaritans as I understand it right now, but the state needs to create a plan. And I know there are organizations that are working very um, diligently on this right now, NAMI Mass and others to try to make sure that there is a plan in place for when 988 goes live in July. Um, but with that, um, we're running close to the end of our time. Ruth, are you okay if we now move to closing the event and our, Absolutely. our 
fantastic moderator for this session. Okay, so I want to thank each panelist, Barbara, Daryl, Fanid, um, and also Dominique Price Conley for, for speaking up and, and raising your voice too um, from the social work perspective during this Q&A session. I want to thank all of you, everybody here who came. This was a tremendous turnout for this event, and we're thrilled that there's so much interest in this bill. As we all know, Joint Rule 10 is coming quickly. Uh, February 2nd is the date when bills have to be reported out of committees or get an extension order. At NASW, we have created, and thanks to Jamie, who's here uh, as well from our team, um, a, a page on our website where you can write a letter to your legislator, and I'm dropping it in the chat now, um, about this bill specifically. So it's mostly this, this sort of pre, pre um, Preamble is um, has social workers in, in mind, but you write your own letter. So you can use our website, feel free to do it. Do it now, you know, right as you're leaving. And it's, again, it's pre-populated. So all you do is you put in your name and your address and it will go directly to your rep and senator about why you support this bill. The other thing I wanna point out is that the bill is in the Public Safety Committee, Public Safety and Homeland Security. Here is the link to the details of who is on that committee. Do you see your legislator there? Do you see your rep or your senator or our reps and senators here right now who are on this committee? We need your support. Can you please let the chairs know that we need a favorable report on this bill by, by February 2nd? If you could please do that, we would greatly appreciate it. And lastly, I dropped this in the chat before, but want to just do it again. This is a link to the fact sheet on the bill. So if you have questions or, or you want to um, write sort of key points in your letter to your legislator or your phone call to legislators, you can uh, reference the, the ACES Act fact sheet here. Um, this has really been wonderful. Again, I see people are dropping off and uh, it is 11 o'clock. So we are gonna close out the briefing. Representative Sabadosa, Senator Chang Diaz, thank you. Thank you for your leadership on this critical issue. Thank you to all the reps and senators here today and to all of our partners in coalition working together for a better way forward as a Commonwealth. We can do this. So let's get this bill passed. Have a great day all, uh, enjoy and thank you so much.
Yes. And that's what the, that's what the ACEs Act does. 